Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship today is from Jeremiah 32, verse 20 through 23. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and to this day in Israel and among all mankind. And you have made a name for yourself as at this day. You brought your people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm with great terror. And you gave them this land, which you swore to their fathers to give them, and a land flowing with milk and honey. And they entered and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for those assembled here today. Thank you for your word, for the promises that are yes and amen, all found in Jesus. Lord, manifest your greatness and your kindness now. Lord, show the signs and wonders to us in the ways that we need. Help us to understand you and what we need from your word. Hear our worship now. Now may it be glorifying to you and good for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you.
So we are in Acts chapter 5, just looking at verses 12 through 16, more signs and wonders is our title. And as we flip there, or click there, or whatever you do, there was a young lady who was once a slave. She was a slave in the state of Maryland. At the age of seven, she was attending to various duties in her master's house and on his property. At one point, there was a beating that was meant for another slave, and she received it and said it was a massive blow to the head that nearly killed her. And something changed inside her. Perhaps it was physical or spiritual or maybe both, but the incident's incident was met with a period of religious fervor. Something changed. She would often break into boisterous singing at a young age and raucous hymn playing and just the overall boisterousness of the Lord. She would often speak of hearing the voice of God. Prior to her escape from slavery, she was known as Araminta Ross, but after marrying John Tubman and fleeing to Pennsylvania years later, she changed her name to Harriet Tubman, of course taking her husband's name and changing her first name. She was an integral part in the liberation of many slaves, leading actually 13 expeditions through the raw, untouched wilderness back into her former slave state in Maryland. She quickly earned the nickname Moses for the deliverance of many captives. This began after she earned her own freedom and she realized how sweet it was for everyone who was still in bondage to taste such deliverance. She focused first on her friends and family and then later others. Her liberation efforts continued for years and she even assisted the Union Army, who was a key spy between the states, in, in the war between the states and an integral in many covert missions during the war. She would often pray loudly and sing boldly, <clears throat> as I said, reciting scripture, though no historian really knows how Harriet Tubman came to know so much about the Bible. She was influenced by Methodists, Baptists, Roman Catholics, and others, but she never really had any college or any sort of schooling, but nevertheless understood the scripture and believed the Lord. She bore a powerful testimony to seek to walk in his favor. Many accountings of her, one in particular of her spirituality, she would say, when danger is near, it appears that my heart would go flutter, flutter, as if there was a supernatural presence that the Lord was showing her. Others testify, the quote, saying, the divine is at work in her. Harriet had a special angel, another said, that guarded her on her journey of mercy confidence that God would preserve her from harm and all the perilous journeys ahead. Harry Tubman was no stranger to signs and wonders that God did through her, and how accurate they are, I don't know, but they are nonetheless accountings of her life. We can learn from her character, and we can see how the Lord moved in her. Let's read the text, and we'll pray. So we're in Acts chapter 5. Verses 12, who wouldn't mind standing, honor the reading of God's word. 5.12, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. Cots and mats, that as Peter, by at least his shadow, might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. God, thank you for this brief section. May we know it, may we understand it, may we learn from it, may we be encouraged by it. Thank you for your word, that it does instruct us, it is our rod, it is our standard. Be with me now, Lord. May your words, may, may, may my words be yours. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you. So Acts 5, more signs and wonders. We're looking at more signs and wonders. Now they're less specific. 
than we've seen in the past. We see a couple chapters ago, Peter and John did what? They healed the, the lame man, right? And of course it was instant. It was like that. It wasn't PT six, eight weeks and go have some surgery and do other things. No, it was instant. He was leaping and jumping for joy and getting all sorts of attention. And of course the people who were stubborn and stodgy over in the corner come over and get upset, throw them in prison, and we see how it goes. But that didn't stop them, right? That didn't stop them. There's no other name under heaven by given among men by which we must be saved, Peter says. And so that doesn't do anything, but in fact, emboldens them. Often, very often, most of the time, probably not all the time, persecution actually makes people stronger. We don't ever want it. I think it's a little strange to crave it, but it rarely ever does the actual effect that the enemy wants the effect to be. But nevertheless, nevertheless, they do it. They do it now. They're doing it in Canada, Australia, for crying out loud. Arresting people and putting people in prison in churches and so on. But it never works, right? It never works. But these signs and wonders are happening once again. Now, they're noted because they're signs and wonders. A lot of times people will think, well, the Bible is just a bunch of dummies. They're superstitious and they just don't really know anything. Yeah, it happened all the time. Or whatever, right? Whatever the skeptic person might think. But this type of stuff doesn't happen anymore. Therefore, the Bible's not true or something. Whatever their reason. But the whole point of signs and wonders is the fact that they don't happen all the time. Just like they don't really happen much during this time. That's why Jesus, in particular, resurrecting from the dead is such a big deal. Because people don't normally resurrect from the dead, right? They didn't then and they don't now. And so that's not an argument, it's a silly argument from the unbelieving person who might use that as their reason to not believe in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But that's exactly why you should believe it, because it doesn't normally happen. So signs and wonders are something that are done to point to things. They're not entertainment. We talked about it briefly in class this morning. They're not entertainment. They're not magic tricks. The apostles are not Las Vegas showmen or street performers doing little certain things to just, you know, get a crowd and maybe some coins. They're rather, signs and wonders are from the Creator God affirming and establishing His covenant. In this case, the new covenant. We saw the ten plagues in Egypt. What was God doing then? He was trouncing and destroying Egypt. And each of those ten plagues were over each of the gods of Egypt. The last, of course, being the death of the firstborn, and Pharaoh's son was touched as well. And in that culture, they worshipped Pharaoh. He was a god. So God took care of each and every one of the Egyptian gods in the ten plagues. It wasn't just because God likes frogs and he thinks it's great to torment people with frogs or fleas or something. No. He was conquering each of those gods. And is pointing to the deliverance of his people. From, so from those plagues, to Balaam's talking donkey in Numbers 22, to the floating axe head of 2 Kings 6, and of course all of Jesus' life and ministry, and the signs and wonders throughout Acts, these things are always pointers. They're always showing us certain things, affirming the message, doing something in particular, not just for kicks and giggles, as they say. So it's not the sign in and of itself, but what it's pointing to is the substance. That's what we should be looking at. And so that's why we don't really need signs and wonders today. We don't really need the affirmation of XYZ person being raised from the dead, though that'd be nice, I suppose. But even if you take Lazarus or the young girl, those people both still died. Though they were raised from the dead after dying, they then died again. But of course you have new life in Christ and you will never die when you live in Him. When you surrender to Christ, you have eternity. So even if you were to live to be 95 and die and then resurrect and what? Live five more years? Well, then you're dead again. If you don't have Christ, that's the real issue. So turn to Him. So many signs and wonders were regularly done, the text says. Notice it's by the hands of the apostles. And there's some kind of nuances in here that if you read it kind of as a cursory reading, it might 
seem confusing. There's some differences of opinion we'll get into in a moment. But verse 12 tells us that God moves through particular people, namely the apostles. And these signs and wonders <clears throat> can happen, but specifically here, they're talking and going through the apostles, God's chosen vessels. So he's pointing to something. Just like if we were to go down to the four-way stop, right, and the little red flashing light, there's a red flashing light right there, right? And we take it down and we go stick it in the Caneyville old school, right? We put it up in one of the closets, we get Debbie to unlock it, we wrap it up very nice and we shove it in there. What's it going to do? It's going to sit there and be in a closet. It's no longer doing its job. Whenever that was made, however many years ago, in whatever factory, wherever that is, the whole goal of the red flashing thing is to say, hey, there's traffic here, stop, look, great, and go. Right? That's the whole point of that. Nothing else. Not to feed us, not to do this, not to be entertaining, nothing else. But the goal is to focus and show what we need to do here. Oh, stop. Oh, there's a car. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. Go. Now we're going. See ya. Like, that's it. But if we take it down, it's no longer doing its job. So similarly, these signs and wonders from the scripture are meant always to point to something. And ultimately, the pointing even is not the red flashing light. That's not the purpose of it in and of itself. Rather, to protect us. Right? So there's a chaos in downtown Caneyville. Right? Crashes and corn spilled everywhere and people upset and screaming and everything else. Nobody can get to the bank because, you know, there's a traffic accident every two seconds. No, that's, it's to help people. Right? Us. We've all driven through there many times. And so that's where these things are. The sign isn't the substance, but rather what it's pointing to is really the substance. So 13 tells us, and this is where it gets a little, <coughs> sorry, interesting. And the end of 12 there, portico, you might have porch, or um, does anybody have anything else besides portico or porch? Colony. Colony. So that's that covered area. Uh, it was on the Temple Mount. It was destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. with with pretty much everything else in Jerusalem. Uh, but it was covered, so it was really hot, or really cold, rainy, etc. People could go there. They could gather, and it was like what we're doing right now. It's nicer we're in here and not out there, right? And so that's really why they're there. Now it's interesting. You look and you think, okay, well. By the hands of the apostles, and then they were all together in Solomon's portico, porch colonnade. None of the rest there joined them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Does that strike anybody kind of? Seems a little odd. Like if you just read it, you're like, so they like them, they're there, but they don't want to join them. But then there are people added. Is anybody catching that? It's like kind of like a. A weirdness there? Well, there isn't. So, <clears throat> somebody might read an email that you write somebody 2,000 years from now. It's possible. Or a note you write your husband or wife. And you might say something in there that they don't know what you're talking about. Or it might reference this thing and they might think, well, like, did she mean... Him or the whole family or I don't the neighbor I don't understand like who's the they in this situation. That is what I believe is happening here. There isn't a contradiction, uh, especially I mean again Luke's not an idiot. He's superintended by the Holy Spirit, so there isn't a weirdness of confusion or contradiction going on here. So that's not what's happening. But it seems like if you read it, these people are here. They're all together, but people don't want to join them. But then people are coming more than ever to the Lord. So how are people not joining but also coming to the Lord? See the problem? Well, I don't think that's what's actually going on. The point really is they're focusing on the apostles. So the apostles are the ones, the they there, and this is where I believe, and there's a few, like I said, differences of opinion, and it's okay because we can try and understand the text. We're not seeking to try and change the text. But based on what we see in verse 14 and 15, how people were coming and gathering and joining themselves 
why would Luke write people weren't joining themselves? <clears throat> so he says, all the people were together. Excuse me. Done among the people by the apostles. <clears throat> and the they there, I believe, is the apostles. We're all together in Solomon's portico. Now that doesn't mean they were alone and other people weren't also there. But the leadership is all there. The whole church is there. That's what I believe. And keep in mind, Ananias and Sapphira were just killed at church when this was, maybe the day before, maybe a week before, doesn't say. And then Peter and John were arrested not many days or weeks before this. So there's already persecution happening. And with signs and wonders taking place, they're starting to think, the people are like, well, I don't know, this is pretty, I mean, okay, we're trusting the Lord, but like, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, I, I would be timid too. Well, I'm sure a lot of us would. So the they there, I believe, is the apostles. They were together. None of the rest, I believe, there is the Christians who are there. Join them with the healing. Meaning, trying to engage with that. Now again, this is mild speculation based on what's happened and what is going to happen later. And even verse 15, where people are being joined together. You can't have people not joining and joining in the same breath. It doesn't make any sense. So the, the rest, I believe there are Christians. Join them, that is the apostles, but the people, other people, outside who weren't of faith, held them, everybody else, in high esteem, or at least the apostles, because they're the ones doing the signs and wonders, right? I know this is kind of, we're going back and forth here, but we got to do it sometimes. Why do I say all this? Because verse 14, more than ever, not just people are saved or come to faith, but more than ever. We haven't seen that yet. Remember, there's already 3,000 people saved, right? There are 120 people, 3,000, and then another either 2,000 or additionally 5,000. So it was either 3,000 plus 2 equaling 5,000 or an additional 5,000. Either way, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people being radically changed, fully understanding what is happening. God changing people. The Yahweh of the Old Testament is now and was fully revealed in Jesus Christ. But, people are people. Signs and wonders are happening. People have already been arrested, Peter and John. And Ananias and Sapphira, let's not forget, what happened? Great fear, verse 11, came over the whole church. Right? Somebody lies to me, and they drop dead. You might be like, whoa. Especially if you know they're lying, because I've called them out. Not to say I'm an apostle. Modern apostles don't exist. Just as a note. That was free. The point is that these people are there and they see these things happening. And the apostles, under much persecution, but they're the ones who are the most bold because the Lord has lifted them up. Other people are like, okay, yeah, but I don't know if I want to join with them. The word they're joined, by the way, none of the rest there join them, isn't a joining the church or being like believing and basically surrendering, as it were. Christ, but rather just a common affiliation. Now again, I know it gets a little sticky, and you might have a different idea or whatever, that's totally fine. If you think it's, I'm totally wrong, let me know. Or if you have a better interpretation. But that's what makes the most sense, because now he says verse 14, more than ever people are being added. You can't have people not joining and associating the people out there, you know, on Highway 64, or downtown, wherever, and this and that, and then at the same time coming and joining the church and turning to Christ. It doesn't make sense. The multitudes. Notice the word, more than ever, multitudes, and then, inclusively, both men and women. Keep in mind, women are not considered uh, as reliable as men at this time. They're not, you can't use a woman in a court of law as a witness, on and on and on and on. So anytime Jesus is spending time with women, or the apostles, or there's this equality thing going on, we think, and you know, modern feminists look at this and be like, ah, oh, so patriarchal, blah, blah, blah. No, this is radical. Far more understanding both the creation order of both men and women being made in God's image and how God cares for both men and women. So Luke includes both men and women are coming to faith. Not just men. It's not just a man's religion and women get to come along for the ride and you just have no choice. Rather, salvation comes for everyone. Anyone can be saved. Anyone can come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's good. 
right? Amen. So, we can see, and I'll read this just kind of my version, and again, I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible, but this is how, for clarity's sake, understanding the text, looking at some other commentaries, and there's several of them differed, many signs and wonders were regularly, regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they, the apostles, were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest of the Christians with them dared associate or join themselves to the apostles, but despite this, the unbelieving people outside held them all in high esteem. Because of this, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. I could be radically wrong, and I'm totally fine with that. I'll, I'm not going to die on this hill. But it's good and a good example that we can at least understand, and I mentioned this briefly earlier this morning in uh, class, that if you come to a part of Scripture and you're like, I don't know, what is he talking about? Well, that's why we want to look at other parts of the Bible where this author wrote something. Like Luke wrote also Acts, or he wrote Acts, he wrote also Luke. So how does Luke use certain words? He writes slightly different than Paul or John does. What does he mean when he says these phrases? What does he mean when he's doing these things? When was this written? Who is he actually talking to? And then you can expand out further, right? The near context, the authorial context, and then the scriptural context of looking at another book that might have this phrase or word or so on. So digging here, we have to understand, even within the own context, that people don't not associate and associate in the same breath. So that's why you have to look at the key words of the they and rest and so on. Those are the key words. So this is all the backdrop of Peter and John getting arrested. This is all the backdrop of Jesus working signs and wonders, miracles through the apostles, right? They're not just doing it under their own power, but they're doing it through Christ, or Jesus. Jesus is doing it through them, rather. So, what's the point, then? What are we doing here? Well, of course, it's not contradictory. Because, again, you wouldn't write something that's just utterly contrary and nonsense, right? You're not going to write, I love you and I hate you in the same breath. You're not going to say, I love pizza and I hate pizza in the same breath. That doesn't make any sense. Rather, Luke is talking about, as we've already addressed, the apostles and the Christians and then those outside. But despite all this and this division that might be happening between the apostles and the Christians not wanting to fully associate, people are still coming to faith. People are still surrendering to the Lord Jesus. So, it's not contrary, but if it does rub us the wrong way, at least we can take this as a good example to say, well, let's dig a little deeper. What does this mean? Read further the context. And Sheila's reminded me more than once, I think it's the Bible study you're doing, right, that she doesn't say just read a verse or two. Read the whole chapter, or even the whole book, right? I mean, a lot of the epistles are three, four, five chapters. It takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And even so, I hope you've read up till this point, uh, Acts 1 through 4, and if not, Read it. And, and look at Acts chapter 5. We're going to be in chapter 5 for the next uh, two weeks, probably. And just to get the flow for it, so you know what I'm saying and where we're looking and how we can understand both what was happening then and how it then applies to us now. It's not just a history lesson. Right? I'm not just up here talking about people and dead, dead people and dates and whatever. But rather, it's also how it applies to us now. It's not just how it applies to us, right? Because it was written to other people, but it is written for us. So it's not written to us, but it is written for us. And we can then take these things and learn from them. Because the Spirit is still moving, and God's Word still is alive, that's why we open this 2,000-year-old book and look at it. Because this has far better things to say than I do. Trust me. And you too. <laughs> so, believers are added. This shows then that people can be saved, despite what's going on. Right? Despite rebellion in a family, right, or the breakdown of a denomination, despite these things, the unfaithfulness of shepherds, people can still come to faith. Why? Because ultimately, we need and have the text of Scripture. And we have God superintending through people in all sorts of ways and means. Doesn't mean we don't try to have fidelity for the local church and for denominations and faithfulness within families and relationships. But, despite all these things, we've heard the stories, the horrible, you know, terrible example that the parents were, divorced, drugs, this and that, broken home, and the kid's amazing. 
You know, now he's a preacher up in Cincinnati or whatever. Or she's a mom of five and homeschools and she's just the best whatever and this and this and this and love it. Like whatever, right? And then there's the reverse, which is also sad and depressing, but it is a fallen world. But we can know that despite the fact that there might be division going on or some friction between the apostles and the rest, the Christians there, people are still coming to faith. People are still turning to the Lord Jesus. So that's what we can dig out of this small section here. Flip over to Luke chapter 8, verse 43. 843. <clears throat> and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, that is Jesus, and immediately the discharge of blood was ceased. And Jesus said, Who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. And Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive power has gone out. So Jesus is touched by this woman. She reaches out in faith and is healed. He doesn't willingly do it, quote-unquote. Of course, he knows what's going on because he's God. But nevertheless, the woman reaches out and touches the fringe of his cloak. Well, that's similar to the kind of strangeness happening here in Acts 5. If you want to look back over to Acts 5, believers are at it, praise God. Verse 15, it gets weird again. The sick, a street, okay, they're going to get healed. We kind of see this. But then Peter's shadow might fall on some of them. Like, what? <laughs> this is the only place that a shadow is talked about as, like, having at least perceived power of healing. Luke doesn't say, and this is where we, we want to be particular when we read the Scripture, really anything, but especially God's Word. What does it actually say? Does it say people were healed by his shadow? It doesn't. Not like Jesus' cloak or fringe of his garment. Doesn't mean they were or weren't, it just has this because this is what the people believed. As if Peter came by, at least, notice this the minimum, the bare scraps, just just to just I mean, here's my shadow right here. Just there it is. But that's nothing, right? That's just shade. <laughs> There's nothing there. And yet. People believed it. One commentator says, In the ancient world, a person's shadow was the subject of much superstition and was believed to represent his or her power and personality and literally be an extension of the person. End quote. And so, that makes sense if people are having these ideas, just like there's people that have ideas all the time when they come to faith, or even if we are believers, we still have certain things about how the world works. You know, people do the old knock on wood or the fingers crossed, just weird, goofy stuff. And like, we don't even know why we do it. Good luck. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, you know, I'm not trying to castigate everybody, but like, we need to know why we do what we do. And these people are thinking, yeah, Peter's shadow. Now, did that happen? I don't know. Probably not. But notice the devotion that the people are having for the apostles that Peter is healing people. They're seeing this happen, and they're desperate, right? They're bringing people, carried sick into the streets, laid them on cots and mats, two different words. One of those words is the one, same one with the paralytic and being lowered down and everything. The one at the pool of Bethesda where he climbs in the water and all that. But there's two different words, so it's, I don't know why they're different, but they are, we're not going to get into it. But Peter's shadow might fall on some of them. Notice this is some of them. But again, this is all just temporal stuff, right? Even if we feed people, we give them a home, we give them a car, we do all these, you know, the hands and feet of Jesus, amen. But that's not the primary means in which God has revealed himself to us and what we're called to do. Now, that is an extension of, say, the church and ministry and living unto the Lord, being a Christian. But it's not the sole thing, right? We don't just go do first aid, you know, American Red Cross sort of thing and just help people, quote unquote, because that's just temporal help. If you don't also, and more importantly, first give the good news of redemption in Christ and forgiveness of sin, you're cheating these people. 
But too often people, especially in the last century or so, many missions organizations will do that. They'll go in and they'll help you know, the poor kids in Africa. That's great. But they don't talk about redemption. They don't talk about forgiveness of sin. They don't talk about God who created, who wants a relationship with those people. But rather just give them free stuff. Well, that's, you're cheating the people. You're doing them a disservice. You want to serve, absolutely. But it's serving in the name of Christ because of the great love that he's already shown you. So we can understand that these people being healed, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But at the end of the day, if they don't preach the gospel, which Peter and John and others did, but if they don't, then they would be cheating the people. But there's a desperation there by the people being carried out the fame of these Jesus followers talking about this resurrected Jesus is all over the place. So much so, verse 16 tells us, that the people gather from towns around Jerusalem. Remember, there's no phones, right? There's no texting, there's no email, no social media. Very hard for news, as it were, to travel. And yet it did. And people are bringing more and more, both those who are sick, different, and unclean spirits. Not the same thing, because they're different, right? So people who have pneumonia or leprosy or whatever. But then unclean spirits, those who might appear to be sick, but they're actually, it's a spiritual condition. An unclean spirit. And they were all healed, the text says. They were all healed. It's not just a citywide thing, but a regional thing. Right? And that broke out so much so, because of persecution, by the way, and we'll see the persecution in the coming weeks, that that drove out people further. And that's why we're Christians today, right? Because they went west, and they went to Italy, and they went here, and they went up to Greece, and then they went further, and they went to Spain, and they went up to, up to uh, the United Kingdom, or whatever it was called, it's escaping me at the moment. But there are people living in England now, at this point, right? There were all sorts of tribes and savages and crazy people up there, and the gospel went up to them. And much of, not all of us, but much of us, our ancestry comes from those places. And then we brought it over here. Now we're here, and then we're bringing it over to China and Japan, and on and on and on. Going down to Africa. The gospel is spreading. The truth is being proclaimed more than ever. And I know, and just as an aside, think about this for a moment. A lot of times it's easy to get stuck in the middle of craziness. Right? Mandates, laws, government crazy, chaos, riots, sickness. But there's more people, not only more Christians on the planet than there ever have been, number one. But there's more schools, more churches, more organizations, more websites, more blogs, more books being written, more languages that the Bible is translated into. We've looked at that in the past. Than ever. Now, a lot of people have this very pessimistic kind of going down view. In my own eschatology, the end times has changed quite a bit recently in the last couple of years. But a lot of people have this pessimistic kind of, you know, just hang up the hat, we're done, it's all going to burn, whatever. And there are some very wise and scholarly people who believe that. But the more and more I study it, and the more and more I look at it, I believe that Christ is winning despite what we see. Because that's what the text says he does, and will, and will always reign. Is he king or not? Is he really supreme or not? That's the question. But so often, and I think we're in the massive problem that we're in, especially in the West, that so many Christians, so many churches, we just kind of holy huddle and that's it. And we just kind of hang it up and, well, you know, wait for that rapture, wait for you know, Jesus to take us home. But we have things to do here. We have to build. Christian civilization was not built by people with that attitude. There's no reason to build a hospital or an orphanage with that attitude, is there? There's no reason to form a republic by the people and for the people if you have that attitude. But rather, if you have an attitude where Christ has already conquered and will one day consummate the ages, and is, His good news is being spread everywhere further and further, not less and less, then there is a difference. It's all classic glasses half full versus glasses half empty mentality. We'll hopefully get into, I'm still trying to decide on what we will do or what I'll do with 
looking at eschatology and the differences therein, but it really does matter. Because is Christ king or not? Is he the Lord or not? Well, here, these people, and even in, throughout the text of Scripture, despite massive persecution, despite having to meet oftentimes in catacombs where they would bury people because they would be persecuted otherwise, people were still being saved. People were still coming to the knowledge of the truth. People were still building and going and had a greater fear of God than of man. Mark 6.53, flip over to Mark 6.53 for a moment. Fifty-three. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region began and began to bring the sick people on their beds to whatever to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in the villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. There it is again. And many as touched it were made well. So again, that's talking about Jesus proper. But again, let's not forget that Jesus has his own power because he's God in the flesh. All everybody else, especially the apostles, it's an extension of Christ. They're not the ones bringing it. They've, we see the other parts soon in Acts where they're being worshipped. Right? The gods have come down to us. And what does Peter and John say? No, <laughs> we're not doing this. We're doing it through the God who made the heaven and the earth. It's not our power. It's not our piety. It's not our whatever that we're doing it. It's because of God himself. And just, again, to close with it, God doesn't have to heal these people. Right? He doesn't have to do any of these things. He could just leave it alone. But it is a common grace, as it were, to heal people. And I believe the Lord still heals people today. Does he do it specifically through people? I, don't, I can't say no, because I'm not omniscient. Right? But there's too many groups that automatically will say yes regardless. Or their discretion is a goose egg. It's zero, and they just believe anything and everything. Whether that's talking about... You know, a deliverance service, or talking and speaking in tongues, or somebody raised somebody from the dead. And it's like, wow, it's amazing. You know, do you have the video? Well, I, we didn't record it. How many people were there? 50 people. So you have 50 little rectangular computer boxes in your congregation, and not one person recorded this? Like, that's a little weird. Right? So there's just nonsense stuff that so often will promulgate itself as Christianity. We don't need to look for these things. We don't need to crave the signs and wonders. We can uh, uh, pray for them. We can look for them. If they happen, great. But again, what are they pointing to? Because so often these charlatans on TV and online and such, they're not pointing to Jesus. Who are they pointing to? Yeah. That's right. Look at me. Sow a seed of faith. Give me this. You want me to do that? Not your hats. No, you don't want me to do that. <laughs> if you, God will bless you, but you've got to have faith. It's all about material stuff. It's going to pass away. It's all about trivial little things. I mean, if I got a better car, cool, okay. Right? Like, but, okay, bigger house. I want a bigger house and land. Okay, now what? Exactly, I want more. That's right, dude. That's right, I want more. We all want more because we're human. We crave it. And I believe so often the Lord doesn't give us what we want, especially material means, because we'll just want more and we'll forget Him all the more. And sadly, 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 I think that's the mass swath of our modern culture. People's bellies are full, the roads are paved, the lights are on, and they got a job, and they think, well, God loves me. That's the same stupidity that the Pharisees thought. God loves me. I'm blessed. Well, I've got this. Look at my little things. I've got the thing here and this. I've got the little scroll up here because he says to do that. And I'm super literal, so I'm literally sticking you know, words on my forehead. And I've got my little tassels and blessings, blessings. Oh, praise God. And they do this whole show. And Oh, I'm going to give to the temple. Look, everyone, clang. And they got the little thing, the loud noise. Ring the bell, do the thing. Inside, they're dead men's bones. They're dead. 
I don't want that, and you shouldn't want that. Don't crave all the wonderful things if you're dead inside. And if God gives you new life through faith in Him, He might give you those great things. You might also not get those great things. But that's the other lie. That so often God has a plan for your life, and then somebody comes to Christ, and then they lose their job. Well, what, what happened? Well, now I'm broke. Now I'm $20,000 in debt. I thought God had a plan. I don't like this plan. That's not the gospel. Right? He might bless you. He has blessed us, ultimately. But even if Paul, like you're saying, or like Paul says, if you're like him, being content in much and content in little. Paul was in prison, shipwrecked, beaten 39 lashes multiple times. And does he deny Christ? Does he say, no, I don't deserve this? Why me? No, but when we have the scripture as our God, when we know that God loves us more than the stuff of this world, that is a vapor, it will pass away. It's far easier to look to him and be focused on him and not these present things. So let's not forget that Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive, right? This time? I got quieter. What's a prescription, right? Take this vitamin C, right? Take this heart medication. Doctor says do this. I got to go to the midway over here and get the thing. Do this thing, right? These are the things that are prescribed. There's many prescriptions in the text. Ten Commandments, prescriptions. But there's also many descriptions, things that are describing something that happened. Acts is predominantly descriptive, and that's what's happening here. Acts is saying these signs and wonders are happening. These people are gathered together. Now, there are principles that we can learn from and grow and emulate in the church and in our lives. Like chapter 6, talking about deacons. They assume that deacons serve. They do this. There's a need here. We need to have some other men to do these things and pick up the slack. Okay, cool. Does it say all churches here for da 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 Not necessarily, No. But that's a good example of a description being used as a prescription because it's wise. And we also see it in other parts of Scripture, too. So the Spirit moves through us in all sorts of ways. He might do a sign and wonder. He might not. But ultimately, He convicts the world of sin, and He also brings comfort. It's not just a, how dare you, you screwed up again, shape up. Or, I'll just give you everything you want. You don't need to have any faith in me. I'll just keep feeding you and giving you all the things you call for, just kind of like, you know, a genie and a lamp. But rub both conviction and comfort. One thing that often convicts me is my lack of faithful prayer. And this group of early Christians reminds us, and me in particular, of that, how they pray. And they had such a deep reliance on the Lord. And so often we want deliverance, we want revival, we want a change, we want something to be better. And it's like, yeah, well, but not me though. I mean, I don't want to do it per se. No, we don't ever say that, right? We're not going to be, you know, so silly to say it out loud. But we think it in our hearts if you're like me. Maybe you're not. But we so often don't want to do the work, right? We kind of want to just cruise control. I'm talking to me too, please. One of the commentators, Vickers, states regarding the outpouring of the Spirit. He says, and I quote, We ought not dismiss the outpourings of the Spirit as merely historical. When we ourselves are not faithful to pray together or to believe that God truly is the Sovereign Lord, who reveals himself in Jesus, the resurrected King, through the power of the Spirit. It is one thing to profess, profess, which we all do, but another to believe that God revealed, the God revealed in Acts still keeps his promise of salvation and eternal life and uses his people to bring about the fulfillment of his new covenant and kingdom promises, end quote. I said it before a while back when we talked about revival. And often that's 
on the tongue of most people. If, you know, if God would send a raw Bible, blah, 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 and this and that, in America, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm thankful for history. But truthfully, the Second Great Awakening, the Second Revival, spawned Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, and all sorts of other Looney Tunes craziness. And that's fairly well documented. And ultimately, ultimately, the revival is always about out there. Are that, is that going to happen? Is that, but how is that going to happen? Right? We want it, let's pray for it. But then how is it going to happen? Other churches, not New Harvest, are going to catch up and do this and work hard and serve the Lord and proclaim the gospel and read and be faithful? Because I mean, we're, we, we, they should do it. Church of Christ, they down there. They, they need to have some revival. The, the Christian church up there. They should do it. Falls are rough, go, you know. Not us, though. I mean, I mean yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll partake if, you know, they do it. I mean, again, have we thought about this? Have I thought about this? I'm not trying to be mean to anybody. Don't hear that. But revival so often, and we can actually control it, as it were, within our own hearts. Can it? We can get up earlier. We can actually say, no, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to read. I'm going to be specific. I'm going to look and say, Lord, show me who I need to bless today. Show me who I need to give money to or pray with or something something that's in my world. Because he's still here. He's still working. Even if we don't see it or feel it. The Lord is still moving through his spirit. He always has and always will. But oftentimes, again, if you're like me, we're blinded by all the other distractions, all the little shiny things and job and life and family craziness of the world. But revival really starts with us. And if we want the Spirit to move, we should act like it. Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text, Lord. Thank you for your word. I pray that I was kind. I pray, Lord, that your Spirit will move in us and that each of us will have a stronger faith even after today. That we will seek to put you first and fear you and not man. If you show us signs and wonders and various works, amen. But if you do not, amen, Lord, for your word is sufficient. Even in the parable, Jesus tells the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus is in glory and the rich man is in torment and the rich man tells him you know the story Lord the rich man tells him that you should send someone back from the dead and Abraham tells him even if somebody were to be raised from the dead they wouldn't believe but rather they have Moses and the prophets they have the Word of God may we cling to your word Lord may we not crave other things pithy things silly things and may we know that revival starts with us. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.